Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, no, I'm not Anna Jenkins, but you already know that. She and Rick are in uh, on their way to Inverness, Scotland, from Manchester, England. So clearly, they are not going to be awake <laughs> right now. So she asked me if I would mind hosting, and no, I don't mind. So happy to do it. Missed the last couple of meetings because we've been traveling. So this is good. It'll be a good catch up for me. I'm Suzanne Booth. I am half of the Suzanne and Charlie team. We're here in Fredericksburg and we've been actively investing uh, for about three years, but we've been landlords for 11 years. Um, because when we got married, we each had our own homes in the same neighborhood looked at both properties, decided that the one that, that I lived in was, was better to rent out and live in the one that he owned. So we did that. And we still own that property. It's a mile from our house. It's probably our, our best rental property that we have besides one downtown. And um, we, uh, let's see, we did one wholesale deal. We did one lending deal. And we're currently doing another one with a very trusted person. <laughs> Not going to make a mistake this time. Uh, we buy from wholesalers. We're ba primarily buy and hold investors. We did one or two flips, but that was sort of an afterthought. And um, so that's who we are. We invest in the Fredericksburg, the, the Virginia region, and in Florida, in Jacksonville area, and on the Gulf Coast around Tampa, Sarasota. So that is us. I wanna welcome everybody to the meeting tonight. We have Rich Lennon, who is going to be our speaker. And uh, we usually start the speakers at about 7.30, but I'm gonna skip over some of the statistics because I'm not a realtor. Rick and Anna usually go over the monthly statistics for here and in Florida pending sales, days on market, that sort of thing. I'm really not familiar with that. So I think I'm just going to skip it if it's okay with everybody. Um, if anybody wants that information, you could probably get, e uh, Anna can email it to you. Okay. And let's see, print it out. Um, before we start, we, we usually like to ask a question of everybody. And um, I'm going to read off the present, I'm going to read off the slide because I can't split screen on my computer. Um, we all have real estate setbacks, okay? Um, hopefully they can help us grow. Hopefully they don't set us back too far or permanently. I'd like to go around, have everybody introduce yourselves, say who you are, what you do, uh, what you're looking, what you, what the type of investor you are if you're just starting out in investing. Go ahead, say that, and uh, say what you are interested in doing. And then for the people who have already done deals, what have you done that has possibly set you back? What were some of your bad experiences? What was your best experience? Uh, we can all learn from everybody's mistakes, and we can also all learn from everybody's successes too. Okay, so what do they say about growing, you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Well, I'm going to bet that everybody here on this call thinks that everybody else is smarter than them. And that's not true. We all have our level of experience. We all have our level of know-how. So we're just going to share it. Okay. So I already told you about myself and my husband, Charlie. Why don't we go around and let's see, start with, uh, let's see, Eric Peters. Welcome, Eric. Hello, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Eric Peters. I'm uh, I'm in Arlington, Virginia. And in case anyone's not in the Virginia area, it's right outside DC, uh, a little bit to the south. Um, so I'm I'm new. Uh, I have not done a deal. I thought I had uh, a couple, but uh, they didn't work out. Um, and so you know, just kind of you know those those just happened like suddenly and um you know when, when I started getting in the weeds I started realizing I needed to have my funding my private private funding uh lined up before I got the deal 
Um, so, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, I don't have anything currently, um, but I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, get, get this part squared away and, and then worry about the deals. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, we have Andrea buys houses VA. So, do you want to un unmute yourself? Okay, your audio is not on. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Can anybody hear Andrea? I think she put in the chat that her audio isn't working. Ah, oh, okay. All right. Well, if you do get it up and working, just wave your hand and uh, we'll give you a chance to speak. Okay, Charlotte. Okay, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Matt. Um, and we uh, purchase vacant land off market and uh, sell it at a discount to investors and builders and developers all around Central Virginia. Um, and we're also interested in private money lending, which we're very new to. Um, what else? Yeah, just land and lending. And um, we are going through a, a property right now that we purchased that's in an HOA. And uh, the title company did not catch that there was a right of first refusal um, in the restrictive covenants during the title search. So we're currently dealing with that, working with an attorney and um, title insurance company and our agent and just trying to figure that out. So that's uh, a big road bump that we um, are experiencing. That Cause we'd already closed on the property. Yeah. Everyone got their money. It was a beautiful done deal. And then um, came up that the right of re first refusal didn't happen. And so, and now a neighbor wants it. And so it's messy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. bummer. Yeah. Learning well, we're interested to hear what the outcome of that is gonna be. Thank you, yeah. Hopefully by the next meeting, assuming you guys are on the meeting, um, please do catch us up because this is this is something that can happen to any of us. For sure. You know, yeah. Especially in this area, there are so many communities, so many subdivisions that are HOA controlled. Yeah. And we have learned um, painfully the hard way because we live in one as well, that they yield a lot of power. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any advice that you would give anybody? um besides don't do it <laughs> it's, it's a title company we're relatively like it's it's one of our first we've used them for a couple other deals but they're, they're relatively new so just have a reputable title company and vet them and yeah use reliable sources uh for all of the people that you work with okay good advice very good advice and asking for the the poa like disclosure packet if it is an nhoa like in advance and going through it ourselves just because um i guess the title company should have caught it but it's good to know um just on the investor side as well. yeah because we should be looking over that stuff ourselves as well okay okay by the way can everybody see everybody else okay. sorry my phone is buzzing and it's distracting there's a conversation going on about this meeting. Uh, let's see, Michelle Dennis. Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry. She's waiting to get in. Sorry about that. We'll come back to her, let her get in and log on. Uh, let's see, Dario. Hey, everybody, I'm Dario here, local to uh, Fredericksburg. Um, I mainly focus on off-market acquisitions and midterm rentals. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything, but in the recent years, I've been just honing in on those two things because that's what I like to do. Um, and a question I have for Charlotte and Matt. It, uh, I'm not sure if title insurance covers that stuff, um, but just curious if they opted to get that. Sorry, we're getting attacked by mosquitoes, so we're transitioning inside. Um, <laughs> the title insurance uh, policy covers us up to the amount of the purchase price of the property. So everything we put into it, survey, perk test, uh, photography, lending costs, all that stuff. And then, you know, the cost of whatever we'll lose if we can't sell it 
for however much we wanted, like we wouldn't be able to recoup any of those costs, at least not with the title insurance company. Interesting. Okay. All right. Cool. So we could have had a better policy that um, we could have had more than the purchase price, but that's what we have with this one. Got it. So okay. Matt, who actually missed that right of first refusal? Um, the seller, us, and the title company. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I think the title company, it probably should have fallen on them. Like if there was one entity that should have caught that um, during the title search, but they did not. Yeah. And they, they read the restrictive covenants and everything, but just said they overlooked it. Um, so it was just... Your lender should have caught it as well. Because mm. lenders have got a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah, because they're the ones who took title on the property. So the deed is in the lender's name. Yep, they got a problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a sticky situation. <clears throat> well, we, we'll hope for the best and anxious to hear what the outcome is. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's see, we've got Julie's iPad. Okay, uh, can you ask to unmute? Can you unmute? Got it. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm new to investing, just has always been something I wanted to um, get involved in. And I've not done any deals yet, just still working toward it. So here to learn from you all. Okay. Well, nice to see you. Nice to have you. Okay. Let's see who else am I missing? Anybody? Jonathan just hopped on. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, what we're doing is we're going around and introducing ourselves and saying what type of investing we do or would like to do if we have not done any deals. And if we have any um, any mistakes that we've made, any of our best successes you want to talk about, and if you have any advice to give people. Awesome. Was it my turn? Or? It's your turn, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good to see a lot of people here that I know already, and, and welcome to, to the new ones. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bagazzo. I'm out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, I actually invest, but all my investments are out of state in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm, I'm more of a buy and hold investor. I love multi-units, um, but I also have some single families. Um, and I'm a little experienced with uh, wholesaling as well. Um, very limited experience with flipping houses. And uh, for the past year, I have been focusing primarily on buying rentals using the Burr method. Is everybody, is anyone not familiar with the Burr method? Because I know we have a couple of new people here. Everybody's familiar with it. Okay. Rick Thompson, who's a part of this group and also part of Nate's group, uh, he gives a really good in, uh, presentation on the Burr method. And um, it's so good, it makes everybody want to go out and burr their next deal. Okay. Hey, right. I just wanted to add as well to the new folks uh, here that um, when I joined this group uh, a couple years ago, I'd never, and I hadn't, I didn't have any rentals and never done any deals. So you're in a good group. You have a lot of wisdom in the group. Uh, and it's, you know, you got, you got Chuck, John, uh, Jonathan, um, you know, and Rich Lennon, who's about to speak. So I definitely, um, plenty of wisdom and, and experience in this group. Yeah, we joined the group a little over, uh, actually it was about two months before COVID shut everything down and it's been virtual ever since. And then we started doing the um, alternating weeks, um, doing in-person, just networking, no presentation, no formal agenda to follow. It was just networking. And that's where actually we met Dario and we're really good friends today. So it's a, it's a valuable group. Let's see, Andrea, her mic's not working, but she did put something in the chat. I live in Richmond, VA, interested in PML, I think. I should probably put my glasses on. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, interested in PML. Not sure what that is. 
I'm involved in one deal right now that is scheduled to close on Tuesday. This is a great thing. Oh, I'm sorry, private money lending, of course. Duh, I should have known that. Okay, did I forget anybody? Let's see, going through the list. I think, yeah, I think that's everybody. Um, has anybody read anything real estate investing related that you find really valuable and that you would like to share with the group? I'll just roll off a couple of these questions. If anything comes to mind, just go ahead and start speaking. Um, what podcasts or, or classes have helped you grow? I know podcasting is a huge thing in real estate and a lot of investors listen to podcasts. Uh, I've been listening to One Rental at a Time and uh, I think he was, gosh, I haven't, I don't even remember the guy's name because it's been a couple of weeks, a couple Schubert, of weeks. Uh, Michael Schubert or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, one <laughs> month at a time. Yeah. yeah. He was one of our speakers a couple of years ago and he was excellent. Yeah. Super good. Okay. I'm actually I'm actually getting rid of an alligator house because of him, his uh criteria of identifying alligators, those houses that you fall in love with, but they're really not making you any money. So you have to get rid of them. That's an interesting term, alligator house. Yeah, that's from him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they eat all your money. And, but, you know, you're so passionate about the house that you think it's a good investment. The, the numbers don't lie. That's an emotional decision that was made. And I'm not dissing on any of you or anybody else because we've made very emotional and expensive decisions, costly decisions ourselves, like lending to people that we think we could trust that we can't. But... um. Yeah, it, it took me a while anyway. Uh, my husband, Charlie, he's my partner, my business partner and my partner in life. And he's still working a W-2 job. Um, so I'm doing this pretty much 95% of the time on my own. And it took me a long time to learn not to make emotional decisions. And that was really hard to do. But... Once you start doing deals and building your portfolio and just having transactions, you learn it gets a whole lot easier not to make an emotional decision, uh, but it's difficult in the beginning, really difficult. Um, what has anybody learned in the last 30 to 60 days that you find will help you in your growth? Hmm. A lot. I mean, I learn every day. I, I think I do learn every day. Sometimes when you feel that you know you got it down, you, you don't. <laughs> so you learn something new. Someone puts a post on Facebook and you kind of like, well, wow, that's what I need to do. Or you learn, you hear something on a podcast, you read something in the book, or, you know, you just learn something new every day. So I learned recently, well, I'm doing a lot of refinances for uh, the birds that we, uh, about to complete the last, well, no, not the last two, we got two more after this, um, is that even though when I thought I was buying cheap, um, I just realized that I didn't buy cheap enough. So with the interest rates, you know, being so high and all that, uh, if you really, really want to do, um, you know, those bird deals where you don't have any of your money into the deal, uh, then, you know, the only way is to buy cheaper. So because we did 11 birds last year and it looks great, but uh, out of those 11 birds, we closed nine, we refinanced nine already. And every single time we have to come with money to the table. And the idea was to come with no money to the table. All, you know, what do they call it? Um, uh, infinite returns, none of your money into the deal. So, you know, you learn. But that doesn't mean that you're not making money, right? No, we're making money. It's just that, um, you know, when you plan on num bringing any money to the table and now every deal you have to come up with a couple thousand dollars, uh, well, that means that your cash reserve has to be a little more uh, robust. 
-hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you start eating into your cash reserve and uh, the lenders that you're using to refi, they want to look into your liquidity. So it just is going to affect that. Yeah. Very it's, true. It's good. I mean, it's a, it was a good learning experience. Uh, I don't think that we've covered this, but is there anything that anybody is um, looking for? Like, what are your needs and wants for, I'm going to say, the next three months? If anybody wants to start. What are you looking for? What do you need? Do you need money? Do you need properties? Do you need contractors? Do you need attorneys, title companies, inspectors, anything? I need a vacation. <laughs> you do. Yeah. I know what you've been through. You do. <laughs> I would say um, I, I, I'm looking for just, um, you know, like contacts and uh, people who would be, you know, potentially uh, interested in, in uh, you know, investing in lending money, because um, I'm, I'm working, I, I'm, I'm working with, uh, you know, some, some people, and, and so finding the deals, um, you know, isn't terribly hard. It's getting the money to, to, because we're up, we're brand new. Um, it's getting the money to take down the deals and, and really, uh, you know, not have to like wholesale them or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I'm looking for contacts. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's that we all need that, but, um, you know, you're, this is the type of networking that you have to do. So this is where you're going to, eventually you're going to be noticed by enough people and your deals are going to speak for you for the, for themselves. The numbers have to be on point and because that's what happened to me. You know, I was hustling and doing all these deals and transactions. I needed the same thing. I needed money. And then um, I got to a point that, you know, some, uh, the, the host of one of the groups vouched for me. She said, this guy knows what he's doing. You know, feel free to jump on his deals and fund them. And that's all I needed. And then after she said that, all these private money lenders were offering me money. But yeah. You keep going to these meetings. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah but, absolutely. Oh, sorry to cut you off. Um, um, yeah, j just, to, just to throw this out there. So I'm a CPA uh, full time. Um, so I, I absolutely, uh, I, I hear you about making sure the numbers are, are correct. Um, yeah, and, and this is my, uh, you know, my first meeting, but if anyone would be interested in, in uh, you know, connecting with me, uh, if, you know, please send me a message and, uh, and we'll exchange information. Eric, the best I'm thing to do is to put your contact information in the chat box and people can copy it down or take a screenshot, take a photo of it. Yep, you're right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and talking about networking, um, what pretty much everybody, the term that everybody hears when we're first starting out in this field is your network, your network is your net worth. And I really believe that's true. So when we first started out, um, the first thing I did is I made a list of everyone we needed on our team. We need a realtor in whatever area we're looking at. We need a property manager. We need an appraiser. We need, um, not necessarily appraiser, they'll take care of that. We need contractors. We need attorneys. And I just get on the horn and spend days and days calling people, introducing myself, who we are, what we want to do, what we're looking for. This is our criteria for the type of properties that we're looking for. And, uh, and it's just been more than valuable. It is probably the the most important thing that we did when we were first starting out. So, okay. Um, oh, I do need to read the disclaimer. Okay, let's see. I don't have it memorized. I'm gonna read it off a sheet. Uh, the topics discussed are for general real estate purposes only, educational purposes only, and is not considered investment advice. Real estate is inherently risky and each transaction is individualized. 
Fred Rea speakers will not be held liable for your real estate investment decisions, actions, or results at any time under any circumstances. Do your own research and always, always seek individualized expert advice for your specific situation. For example, an attorney, an accountant, an investment professional, or any other professional service provider for proper representation for your own protection. Uh, and for those of you who think that you are gonna hop on and see Rick and Anna, uh, they, I'm Suzanne Booth. They asked me, they're out of the country right now, and they asked me to uh, admit, admit someone. No, they, they asked me to host tonight. And I already introduced myself, but I will tell you a little bit about Rick and Anna. Anna Jenkins is a real estate broker, property manager, investor, notes lender, landlord, and owner of Home Dream Realty and Property Management and Home Dream Property Solutions. I think that last one is her company in Florida. Rick Benez is her uh, partner in life and partner in business, and he's a real estate investor enthusiast, uh, and he's a, a real estate broker. So, oh, we have two more people who just joined. So, um, Kara and Josiah, Josiah welcome. Uh, what we've been doing so far is we've been introducing ourselves and saying uh, where we're located physically, if we are new to real estate investing, if we've done any deals, what, uh, what have we learned, mistakes, successes, if we haven't done any deals, or even if we have, what are, we what are you looking for? Are you looking for a, a wholesale deal? Are you looking to do a burr? Are you looking to partner with someone? So um, yeah, just take like a minute or two and give, tell us a little bit about yourselves. And I will, let's see, Kara, if you are ready, we'll go, let me ask you to unmute. Okay. It's weird controlling the screen from the host stand. <laughs> um. Sorry, I have a baby in my hand. That's okay. <laughs> um, just finishing dinner. I'm Kara. I am new to investing. We live in Spotsylvania. We are actually new to the area. We moved here in November. Um, we are just trying to Hello. get started and learn as much as we can. So my husband can eventually spend a little more time with us and not go overseas all the time. That's our main goal. Are you military? Uh, he works as a contractor for the military. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He well, goes away a lot. Thank you very much. Glad to yeah. be here. Yeah, you're you're amidst uh, a really great group of people. Yes, I've been really enjoying all the meetups that we've gone to so good. far as well. Good. It's been a good good turnout. Okay. Um, um, but thank you. What's your baby's name? Uh, this is Rowan. This is number three, and they end. <laughs> well, he's welcome to or she. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're um, good. Josiah, um, you want to hop on and introduce yourself? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Josiah. I'm located in Lawrenceville, Georgia. I was hoping to find someone who has interest, who is into private lending and also wholesaling and could partner or take me on a deal for a shadow or actually partner on a deal because there are houses that I've seen that I would like to get into as well and to really like help me understand and show me the process. Okay. How did you find this group? I think on Meetup or Eventbrite. Okay. Well, if you're interested in private lending, um, this is this is a good meeting to attend. Okay, I think, uh, let's see, our upcoming speakers are, tonight we have Rich Lennon of private, uh, he's talking about private lending pitfalls. Next Thursday, the 22nd, we will have an in-person networking Meetup, and that's going to be upstairs at Wegmans in Fredericksburg. It's um, we'll probably move the venue at some point, but our group at one point it got so big that there were no places that would accommodate us. So right now we're meeting at Wegmans. July 13th, we have Brent Bowers, the Land Sharks. I guess that's the name of his company, the Land Sharks, and that's on July 13th. And on July 27th is our next in-person networking. And again, that's at Fredericksburg. And the, oh, by the way, the in-person meetups are from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, let's see. We've covered that, covered that. Does anybody have a property they wanna pitch? 
Are you wholesaling? You're looking to rent it? You're looking to sell it? Okay. Well, yeah, sorry. I have a limit. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you go ahead, Jonathan. No, I was just saying, I'm selling one of my rental properties in the alligator house because it needs <laughs> a little bit of work and I don't want to put the money into that house. So if anybody buys in Plymouth, Pennsylvania, let me know. Where at Plymouth, Pennsylvania? Yeah, it's in Lucerne County, um, about uh, 40 minutes from, south from Scranton. Okay. And I, I, um, I have a one bed, one bath in downtown Fredericksburg. That's going to be first. If anyone knows, coming anyone that's coming to the uh, Fredericksburg area, have a medical or anything like that, someone that's displaced from home, let me know. I can help them out with some housing. And you're renting that, right, Dario? Yeah, it's a furnished rental. Okay. So is it short term or long term or midterm or just midterm? Uh, I'm just trying to stick to 30 plus days. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're about ready. Did I miss anybody? If I did, just start shouting. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to hear our speaker. And so let me let me introduce him. Uh, let's see, Rich Lennon. Rich and his wife, Stephanie, have been investing in real estate since 2003. As Virginia natives, they were attracted to Richmond for its housing market, its deep-rooted family values, and tight community that makes the River City so special. They moved to Richmond in 2012, and by early 2013, RVA Property Solutions was established. While one investment property remains in Northern Virginia, their current portfolio is concentrated where their family resides in Chesterfield and surrounding counties. Learn what pitfalls he's experienced with private lending and how to avoid them. Yes, I definitely need that. So what I'm gonna do is I will see, hit that and see, oh, no, I don't need to do that. Hey, Rich, I think that you can take the screen now and show your presentation. All right. Oh. Hey, right. oh, man. Let me just reorganize my board here a little bit. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, I met Anna. Hmm, hey, why? I don't know where I met Anna. It might have been at the the seminar that I did in January. Um, I don't. That, I, that might not be right though. I just can't remember. And she had talked about a couple of the members of the Fredericksburg group had had some struggles with lending. And I told her, hey, I've done a decent amount of lending. And if I, she wanted me to come talk to the group and try to pass on some advice. I was happy to do so. So um, I had a lot of help from other investors um, throughout my career and they just kind of pushed me along. And so I was just kind of happy to give back and you know, anything I can do to help. Tonight's presentation, I'll try to hit what I think is important in lending. And I do really well with questions shouted from the back of the room. So if you got a question along the way, like don't wait, don't wait till the end of the meeting. Feel free to interrupt me and you know drill down on me. Uh, I have even uh, like some general pitfalls and some general rules to go by. And then I also took some language out of my own notes and deeds of trust that I thought were important for you to have in your notes and deeds of trust. And I'll show you what they are and what they mean and why I think they're important. And whether you're a lender or a borrower, I think that um, you can gain a lot of value from understanding that note and deed of trust. All right. So... Just go, let's see if I just click here. I always like to put this one up. It's a less um, less formalized, I'm not responsible for what I say than um, Suzanne just uh, read, but uh, I'm just a guy. I'm just a business person. Don't ever listen to anything I say and do it. I sold an attorney, um, consult uh, CPA, et cetera, et cetera. I'm happy to share my story, but I always encourage people, uh, don't take everything with a grain of salt, particularly when you're listening to someone speak. Um, just, I know that from a bunch of people who have spoken. So anyway, um, don't listen to me. All right. <clears throat> a little bit about myself. Uh, I started real estate investing. Yeah. I own some homes in 
2003, I first bought, but really more of an accidental landlord and held some properties up in Nova. It wasn't until 2011 or 2012 that I really started accumulating properties. Um, I bought primarily on the Burr method for a long time and flipped. Um, so I've been buying for 10 or 11 years. I, at my heyday, I was buying three to four properties a month. And so it really was a full out business of at 14 employees, a lot of them virtual assistants. And I accumulated a lot of properties in a fairly short window, seven, eight, nine years, something like that. I also like to tell everybody the story of just so you know who you're listening to and that they don't always know what they're talking about. I, when the pandemic happened, I was like, oh, wow, the, 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 the prices are going to go down. You know, the world is ending. And so I kind of pulled the plug on the business and said, hey, I'm not going to buy any more properties. I'm not going to flip, you know, and of course, property values went up 40%, right? So I was like, totally missed it, right? And um, I pulled the plug on the business and I stopped buying homes. Um, and then as happens, the money begins to accumulate and build up. And then I became more aggressive at lending money. And uh, I've been lending money pretty heavily since 2020. Although I really started maybe lending money yeah, part-time and moving my money maybe around 2014 or 2015. I think lending money is extremely important part of every real estate investor's strategy. Um, no matter how little amount of money you have, you should be lending your money. Um, it's a way to work the money while you work the rest of the business. Uh, a lot of people think that when you're lending money that now you don't have money for your own stuff. I have found that that's not true. And that um, when you, you just like on the rich dad, poor dad, where you pay yourself first, you lend first, and then you run the rest of your business out of what the money left over. And I have found that to be a very successful formula. So always move your money, always keep it moving. You should be looking for deals all the time. And it should just be, hey, I have $6,000 in my Roth because I contribute it. Well, you should lend that. And there are different strategies at $6,000 than there are at $150,000. But anyway, lending is very important. These are my terms. I lend 13%. That's an APR, it's an annual percentage rate, uh, and three points, and I do that for six months. So my, my, my notes and deeds of trust are always for six months. You know, the reason I do that is to keep control of the deal. I'll talk about default today a little bit and the importance of a note being in default. And... Uh, one of the ways I try to control that is I make short-term loans. Um, now, my next slide will tell you my average loan size is 186000 and my average length is eight months. And so my average note will default at six months. And it leaves me the opportunity whether or not I want to renew the note or not. If someone's doing a good job and they're communicative and I'm happy with the project, I'm happy to let the note go on. I'm happy to re-up at the same terms that we did it in the first six months. But my first term of six months is used as a strategy for default. You can't take a house back until it goes in default or the balloon or it's, the note is due. And so if you've got someone who ever in a house that you can't get control over, one of the ways you do that is you limit how long you're willing to let the money out. You can always renew. You can, there's nothing to prevent you. In fact, it's in my deed of trust that I can renew, but you're not obligated to renew. And in this regard, the lender now has the power in their relationship, which I think is really important. All right. I currently have about 27 loans at that rate. And so as you can imagine, it's a bit of a machine. So maybe I do like 40, 45 loans a year. So um, I just for experience reference, you know, I lend a decent amount of money. I will tell you, I have never lost money on a loan. Okay, knock on wood. That's not a personal challenge out to the universe. Um, I've had some sticky situations uh, for sure. And solving problems is what we do as real estate investors. I was in the business for so long and I did hundreds of flips. It's not an exaggeration. I'm very comfortable to go in and see, hey, this is truly a problem. Or, hey, it turns out getting a permit from the city kind of stinks. And we can let this, you know, we can let this loan go farther. Right. So I have a pretty good understanding of that. Right. <clears throat> I am an asset-based lender. I only lend based on the asset. I have no emotional involvement at all in the, in the deal. And in fact, I think my next one, an attorney gave me this good advice one time that I think is very, very accurate. You can do business with a criminal. That's not a problem. You just have to know it at the beginning. I 
finding out halfway through the deal that the person is a criminal kind of stinks, okay? But if you know that they're a criminal going in, the power of your documentation and your process and the way you handle it can mitigate even a criminal, right? And that's the difference for a brain. Hey, I'm, I lend a lot. I'm a professional versus maybe I'm an amateur or I don't have that experience yet, right? Experience is what you get five minutes right after you needed it, right? And um, and that's what a lot in money lending will teach you a lot of those experiences, right? So I go into it with the mindset of the person across from me can be a criminal and therefore my documentation and process has to represent that, right? So I'm not afraid to do business with anybody, all right? I always lend with a note and deed of trust secured to real estate. That's it. Now I will go when I'm in my really creative mode and I'll do some joint ventures with tend to be things in my IRAs and maybe a little bit creative um, and maybe an advanced strategy. But I would say as a lender, you should be lending 99% of the time with a note, deed of trust, secured to real estate. That is the number one way that's going to indicate whether or not you're going to get your money back. All right. Well, also, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, for the newbies in, in the room, um, still learning the language, can you define or explain note and deed of trust secure sure. to real estate? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the note, and I, I've got some note terms when I go through. So I got some slides for that. And I'll talk about some of the terms that I think are important in that document. The note is um, what you sign that agrees to the terms of the loan. I'm going to lend it to you at 13% and three points. Um, you're going to have to pay me every month. You're going to have to have, um, there could be lots of requirements that go into the note. The deed of trust is the legal document that you prepare and it gets filed at the courthouse, right? And then a trustee, which is often an attorney or a title company, if you're closing at a title company, will often be the first trustee, right? They have the right to foreclose on the property if you don't follow the terms of the note. And the deed of trust lays out the responsibilities for everybody. It becomes very important during a foreclosure. And by attached to real estate, I mean it's filed at the courthouse. Um, I, of course, prefer to, uh, to lend in first position, but second position doesn't uh, intimidate me either. In some states, it's not called a deed of trust. It's called a mortgage. Correct. Like we are, we're a no deed of trust state, but it's like half in the United States. Others are mortgages. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. So uh, this is what Anna, Anna asked me to talk about. So I just put some potential pitfalls that I see with uh, with lending, kind of laid out seven or eight of them. Number one is inadequate due diligence. You have to do your own due diligence. And if you're going to be a money lender, you can't rely on other people to evaluate the, the property. <clears throat> For this reason, I really encourage people to only lend in areas that they're familiar with. And it's, you can go to places in the world where one block versus one block, the difference is a $500,000 house and a $100,000 house. And if you're not familiar with the territory, it's hard for you to do your own due diligence. You cannot rely on the due diligence of the person asking for the loan. You have to have an independent process. And I wouldn't use just one real estate agent either. If you don't really have the expertise to do it, you should get a blended opinion. And you have to have that process set up before someone asks you for money. You have to know how are you going to do the due diligence to make sure that the property is worth what it says it is, right? And on the borrower itself, it goes back to that thing of, hey, you can do you business with a criminal, but it really hurts to find out in the middle, all right? Number two is, of course, insufficient collateral, where you didn't have, where they said, hey, the property is worth 300, you took it at their value, and then when they went to sell it, it's only worth $250,000. When the, when the person flipping the home is, or going to do the borrower, whatever there is, when your borrower no longer has an upside, as in they no longer have the ability to make money, that's a huge indication that your deal is going to go bad. Because people will quit if they're not going to, and they'll walk away from the situation. Not everybody, of course, right? Good people have had bad situations and they trudge through and they they lose money and that happens as part of the business. But it's a, it's a really important indicator of something that might go wrong. So you really have to make sure that your collateral is sufficient. And don't be afraid to ask for additional collateral. How many times a flipper has come to me and said, oh, I can get 200000 for that home. And I'm like, I don't know. And I say, oh, do you have another piece of property that I could put an additional uh, lien against as collateral for this note? Oh, you do? Okay, let's do that. 
And now I'm, I'm between the two properties, I'm more comfortable with the situation, right? So the collateral doesn't have to be just the property they're talking about. I think a very way to, good way to secure your money is to ask for a second form of collateral, all right? <clears throat> this one, you would think it would go out without saying, but boy, people were really bad with their documents. And not having good documents will really burn you when things go bad. When everything goes well, it's not a problem, right? Nobody actually reads documents. That's my opinion. Not the attorneys, by the way. Certainly not the title companies, right? We just heard about people in the title company that didn't read uh, didn't read the report on the right of first refusal, you know, as you need to get uh, good legal representation and get good legal documents that is a good note and deed of trust relevant to the state that you're in, all right? And um, I'll go over a couple of key provisions in a little while that I think are important, but any any real estate attorney can write a note and deed of trust for you. They're going to ask you what to say, by the way, but any one of them can do it. It should probably cost you $250 to $350 to get one written. It isn't that expensive and it's well worth it. It also puts that attorney on the buck if something goes wrong, right? Now, my important one here is, and this one's often overlooked, is the inadequate borrower's exit strategy. Does your borrower have more than one exit strategy as a, as a possibility? For example, if you're lending to somebody in the after repair value of the property is $200,000, if things go wrong, they might be able to turn it into a burr, right? The price point is sufficient that now they could rent it and still hold the debt. On the other hand, if you're lending to someone and they're borrowing $500,000 and they're going to sell the McMansion for a million dollars, the exit strategies become very limited because you certainly can't rent that out and make a profit. Maybe it's a beach house, maybe it's a river house, there's some exceptions. But in general, you need to make sure that the person that you're is borrowing has multiple exit strategies that work for them. And you have to be the one that thinks for them because the borrower, will, you will think that they will have thought those things out, but the reality is they have not. And so you need to take that into consideration when you're deciding whether or not to approve or not the loan. How many exit strategies are there? Could you sell or finance it? Like, what are you going to do if the market goes wrong? One exit strategy isn't sufficient, right? This is another big one. Ignoring the regulatory requirements. Does anybody know what usury is in Virginia? What's the rate? It's 12%, right? So usury in Virginia is 12%. And so you can't lend to somebody more than 12% if it's them personally. You can lend to someone in an LLC or an entity, a correct entity, for as much as you want, 30%, 50%, 150%. There's no restriction. But you have to understand usury. There's another one, that another important regulation. You cannot lend to owner-occupied properties. Say it again. You cannot lend to owner-occupied owner properties. Dodd-Frank really put an end to that. And what it means is if you lend to an owner-occupied, you cannot foreclose. Ask me how I know. Because I got legal advice, which was wrong. And I lent to someone who I lent to their LLC, but they were owner-occupied in their home. And I was unable to foreclose on them. I could have gone through the process, but I knew that a judge liked, because I educated myself, between the time that the loan was due. And this person overran their note three to four months. And I had to really just sit there and tolerate it because in the back of my mind, I understood I would not be able to foreclose on an owner occupied on that type of note, right? So you have to understand the regulatory requirements as well, right? This is one that people mess up all the time, particularly if you're doing a lot of loans. They lose track of the money taken in and the money gone out. If you're lending and you're lending to appropriately, where you're lending and then you're doing a construction draw, which I highly recommend, you have to have a really good documentation of what the money coming in and what the money going out. And it does become fairly complicated only after doing two, three, four, five loans, right? So you're responsible for it because eventually you as the lender are going to be asked for a payoff and you're going to write what that payoff is. If you're wrong about your payoff, you have some consequences, 
right? Somebody can come back to you and they can sue you later and say, you collected too much money. They can collect penalties from you and they can collect interest for the money. So it is significant that you keep track of it and keeping it in separate bank accounts and stuff like that. It's really important. So the money inflow and out on the loan, you got to keep good books. All right. <clears throat> um, this one's important too, is you have to have a pre-plan to what are you going to do when it goes into default? Do you have the attorney picked out already that's going to do the foreclosure, right? Oftentimes you'll close at a title company and that person will be the trustee, but you're going to switch your trustee to an attorney um, before you do your foreclosure. And so it's important. It's kind of like when you're going to evict somebody, you know, when they don't pay the rent by the sixth, you should send the payer quit immediately. You don't wait, right? You can always stop the foreclosure. You can always stop the, um, the eviction, but you can't stop it unless you start it. And so having that process laid out, even before you've never had to go through is really important because time really does matter. And you need to make sure that you're on it, especially if you're lending a lot of money. All right. This is another one that I think is really important that I think lenders lose track of is the inadequate reserves. Yes, your borrower has to have enough money to be able to do the project, but you have to have enough money that even though you're lending that for six months, you've got to know that you're not going to get that money back possibly for 12 months or 18 months. You have to be comfortable and you have to make sure that you don't take all your money and lend it. And, and that's what puts you and lenders in some trouble sometime. Hey, this person didn't pay me back. That does happen, right? So that is a process to go through. And so you have to make sure that you aren't bankrupt and destitute while that's going on. It puts undue pressure on your business and the other parts of your business suffer, let alone the personal relationships with your spouse, right? So like if I'd go to my wife and say, well, we can't eat this week because I made a really big loan. They didn't pay me back. She's going to be upset about that, rightfully so, okay? So inadequate reserves is a, is a constant source of stress for lenders, okay? All right, any questions on that? Because I'm going to kind of go into like things on a deed of trust. Super exciting stuff. No, no questions? Um, I have, um, and yeah, I have a quick one. Um, I know obviously you're not offering legal device, but, uh, advice, but uh, in Ohio, I have a property that I'm seller financing at a at a higher rate than the usury laws. Um, and, you know, I have kind of, I've done, I didn't do more diligence, but you just kind of a light bulb for me right there. Um, and it's, it's a, I'm seller financing a home. It's not a private money loan, but um, yeah, I imagine I'll have to get with an Ohio attorney to make sure I'm, I'm on the up and up for that, right? You do. Avoid you, if you're doing a seller finance, <clears throat> you need to make sure that your interest rate is not above usury. Okay. Well, I, I, from what I'm reading, it is. Um, now, there's some stipulations that say it can be under certain circumstances, and I think I meet those, but I'm not an attorney. so um, It probably has something to do, if I had to guess, with the number of loans you do, right? <laughs> As, if, without reading in front of it, that typically tends to be, are you a personal person? You can normally do one or two things one or two loans and not be compliant to Dodd-Frank. But once you do a certain number, you become, you have to like follow the rules. It's kind of like a rental. You don't have to follow the fair housing until like you get two or three houses and then you got to start, start, make sure you follow all the fair housing. Same thing for notes. Okay. Very good. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Rich. Yep. Rich, I got a follow-up question to that with Dario's situation. Um, if, if Dar so Dario bought a house in Ohio, the seller is doing the financing, but apparently he's charging higher than 12%. And that's only a problem because he's lending to Dario as an individual and not as a company. Is, is that, am I understanding this correctly? No, I had it the other way. So I'm glad you asked. For me, it was the gentleman, if the gentleman is, is, giving Dario the house on seller financing, Dario doesn't live in the home. Therefore, he can charge as much as he wants on the interest rate. Now, if Dario as a strategy turns it around, wraps it somehow, which I assume you're doing Dario or something like that. And then now you're doing it. Now you're going to take it to the end buyer that there's going to live in that home. And Dario is adding an interest rate so that he gets the spread. He gets that arbitrage. That'd be my guess is what he's doing. And so he can, <clears throat> lend above that usury rate, but the person can lend to him above the usury 
right? Because Dorio is not owner occupied. Okay. But yeah, so I'm I I own the I I closed on the property and now I'm seller financing it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm not wrapping it, but um, but yeah. So and just to give some context, I, I'm offering at twelve percent, which I already have it under contract at that. Um, so now I have more work to do. So thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, <laughs> I already learned something. Thank you, Rich. It only becomes important down the road if they educate themselves and then and they don't pay you when you go. Oh, I'm going to foreclose. And then they go get an attorney and the attorney goes, oh, that's usury. And now you're the bad guy. And so you have to, you'll, you'll be able to get your property back. It's not gone forever. It's going to take you a long time to get it. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay that. You're going to pay that homeowner, you know, because in the eyes of the, of the state, you're the one who made the mistake. Right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. This is one that I put in all my loans. So I, 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 you must have a cross default and a cross collateralization uh, to borrow from me. Now, if you're only borrowing one house from me, it doesn't really matter. There's nothing to cross default, cross collateralize. And what I mean by that is if we're in, in a house and by cross collateralizing it, if you have two loans with me or three loans with me or four loans with me, or some people have five loans with me, right? If one of them goes bad, I can still get the money from the other deals because there's equity in the deals. And that's called cross collateralization, right? I also have cross default, which is different, all right? Cross default is if you default on one, you default on them all. And so if you stop making payments or you don't pay your taxes on one of the properties, you've now put the entire portfolio in default. And we'll kind of go through why default is really important. But you'll hear me several times mention, sometimes as the lender, you really are trying to push a situation to where it's in default. And therefore you can go get the property back. Because if you lend for a year and you don't put someone in default, you can't go get the property back, even if they're making it a nuclear waste dump, right? And so you're always looking for ways in your deed of trust to make sure that you can put somebody in default, all right? All right, and this is one of the ways, and this is in the deed of trust. And basically what this says, and the grantors, and that's the person who borrows the money, the grantor has to pay all the taxes, right? All the bills, all the utilities, like everything that associated with the property has to be paid. And if it's not paid, there it's in default, right? And so that's important because you can't foreclose unless something's in default. But if you haven't paid the taxes, by definition, that's in default. And remember with your cross collateral and cross collateral, uh, uh, cross default to like not pay the taxes on one makes it so that you basically didn't pay the taxes on all of them, right? And again, this is a situation where you're just taking power in the relationship. Whether you use the power or not is a totally different discussion. But I have found when lending money, you want to be in control. You want to be able to make, be the person making the decisions, right? This is another one. People, people sometimes they 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 want to put it's required by statute that you put the when they're in default and you're going to foreclose on them you have to put it in the newspaper and you have to advertise and you have to advertise a certain number of times and for a certain length and every deed of trust is written different some of people have i have to post three times and three weeks apart or you have to post four times and two weeks apart. This is the minimum that it's required to do it, right? And then I also urge you to do that and that you only have to post it twice and on the 15th day, you can file for the foreclosure, right? Again, you wanna make sure that anything that you have to do in the process is at a minimal amount of work for you. And so the timeline can be as fast as possible. And it matters a lot when you're not moving your money, all right? Rich, can I interrupt just for a second? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I, I apologize to Chuck. Uh, he does, his microphone is not working and he posted a couple of questions and comments. So okay. can I okay, I'll just read them? So he, he wanted to address Eric. Uh, he said, don't you don't necessarily need money lined up before putting a deal under contract. Just have a conditional on your inspection and it gives you time to find the money and can, you can still be released from the contract. He also said uh, for his needs and wants, he's learned, he's interested in learning about 
other lenders loan extension requirements, which I think you're covering, and what, if the loan goes longer than expected. Um, he also said the second property as collateral, shouldn't the borrower own free and clear the second collateral property? No, the, the second, a couple of those things. First, I would say I, I know Chuck well, Chuck and I know each other very well. Love Chuck, a lot of respect for Chuck. I disagree from a legal perspective on the first thing that he said. Legally, you cannot enter a contract unless you have a, a way to fulfill the contract. And if you don't have the way to get the money, I bet an attorney can make the argument that you signed, you, you went into a contract without knowing that you didn't have the ability to fulfill it. And so I think that that's something that could get someone in trouble and that the inspection period is meant for the inspection of the property. It's not meant as a finance period. And so I would disagree with that one a little bit. Although I think as a practice, I think a lot of people do exactly the way Chuck described. Right. Uh, it's kind of like getting a pre-approval letter if you're doing it. Exactly. But it but it becomes important in a lawsuit, you know, because like 99 percent of law, all lawsuits are negotiated. They don't go to trial. So everything is a negotiation. So if the other attorney goes over and says, oh, well, how do you know, they'll attack you in those situations and you have to be able to prove that you could have bought the home. Otherwise, it's fraudulent for you to sign the contract. That's the kind of same issue with wholesalers. When they sign a wholesale agreement without the ability to close on it, it's something that attorneys would not appreciate. Okay. I have, said, a little, said, Thank I have a little. Thank you for a bullet. <laughs> I have a little piggyback on, on what just uh, Rich just said, uh, more of a question. So like when you get your, um, your I guess, pre-approval letter from your hard money lender or private money lender, it, the letters that I've gotten says it's still... Um, it's still subject to the lender's final approval, right? And that's obviously the lender protecting themselves. Um, does that still, is that kind of, do you fall into the same predicament that you just mentioned? Because, you know, like, I mean, you're showing that you have access to the money, but it's not guaranteed that you can. Yeah, but now because you have that letter, and by the way, it doesn't even have to be a letter. Like, let's say you met a lender, you met me at a convention, like, hey, Rich. If I get a house that meets the criteria, will you lend to me? And I say yes. Okay, now you have a reasonable, reasonable, you have an articulable, reasonable way that you could have purchased the home. Yes, financing falls through, but if you've sold enough times, you know with homeowners that financing falls through there as well, right? And so the the question is the legality of the signature on the contract. And so if, if you think that you have the ability to close on it, then you're good. Ah, gotcha. So it can be a verbal agreement then. Yeah, it can be, it doesn't have to be heard. It has to be like, okay, if the lawyer then, in this situation, there's a lawyer who's mad at Dario. Dario's mm -hmm. a great guy, it would never happen to him. But a lawyer's <laughs> mad at Dario, okay? And then and then the lawyer goes, well, how are you going to buy pay for it? Well, Dario says, well, Rich was going to lend me the money. And as, as long as it, when that attorney calls up and I say, yeah, I love, I love Dario, I would have lent him money, no problem. Dario doesn't have any problems. Right. The issue becomes if the lawyer calls up and I'm like, ah, that Dario guy's a jerk. I told him a long time ago and never lend him money. Now Dario's got a problem. So the so the written thing is is the best for him, right? But mm -hmm. you don't have to go all that way to it. You just have to have a reasonable suspicion that you can close the contract. I gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So like going out, getting a property under contract, never having even spoke to a private money lender, and and then trying to do it the other way around, not, you can put yourself in a pickle, right? You put yourself in a little bit of jeopardy if you sign that contract and then you defaulted and you didn't close on it. Mm -hmm. Now you might be liable for that, for the value of that contract. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Rich. Well, we're definitely in the weeds there, but like it is, it is, a, it is a little, little distinction, but as a guy who's, you know, had people sue him in the past, these little things, they make a difference in a lawsuit. All right, so I got my next one up here. I'll just keep rolling here. This is another one that I put in here. The renewal, extension, and reinstatement is permitted. That's all I say about whether I will extend the loan in six months is what's written in my deed of trust, and that's what it says. There's no guarantee that I will that I will renew it, that I will extend it, or that I will reinstate it. I simply say that I can do it. And if I want to do it, all I have to do is write up a, a document, a piece of paper that we agree to the terms on how we're going to do it. All right. And I gave you the example of, hey, 
my terms are six months, but everybody goes eight months. So like the extension and renewal is pretty commonplace and it's pretty easily handled, right? Hey, we agree you're doing a good job and you can keep going, all right? Don't forget about insurance, right? And, and it's gotta be equal to the replacement value of the property, right? It's not what they borrowed from you or something like that. Because remember a lot of the time they get, they get equity in the deal, right? So you wanna make sure it's for the replacement value of the property in case there's a fire or something like that. It's good for them as well. Get the replacement value instead of just your money. Although I put in my note, that you have to have at least the, the amount that I lend you, all right? And I think I say something about insurance on my note as well, all right? This is another one that's important. Is It's in there. The substitution of trustees are permitted for any reason. I don't, I don't have to put you in default. I don't have to foreclose against you. But oftentimes people close at title companies. And if I don't like the way a situation is going, I will just substitute the trustee to my friendly attorney who knows me well, and it will take my phone call and I get that set up. And all I have to do is file a piece of paper. And now the trustee is the person who's going to do the foreclosure is an attorney that I'm familiar with, right? Because I don't want to use someone that I'm unfamiliar with to do a legal battle, right? And so- Can you, switch, what, that? Trustee, can you switch trustees after all the paperwork has been signed and executed? Yes. And that's normally how it would happen. Like for example- you know, like Wells Fargo on a, on a homeowner, Wells Fargo will do the loan, right? And then the, the title company that did the, the loan closure or the attorney will be the trustee, right? As you start off, but now that it goes into foreclosure, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Samuel L. White, but he's the guy who does so many of the foreclosures in the area. And so what, what happens is Wells Fargo contacts the Samuel White, and they do a substitution of trustee and basically it just moves the file from the from one office to the other office, and they move it to an attorney who specializes in foreclosures. Okay, All right. Another one that people forget in their personal loans is the due on sale clause. Like it's in every like we know how to do subject twos, but I, I often see that sometimes people when they write their notes they forget the due on sale clause. So don't forget your due on sale. Um, it's an important piece of these being your deed of trust. All right. And this one's a little long. I'm not going to read it all. But the other one, make sure you need to grab in your deed of trust is you need to get the uh, the rents and profits, right? So if you if someone goes into default, you have the right then to collect the rents, you know? So if there's a tenant in place, like if it's, think, think commercial building, you know? Think $10 million commercial building of where um, you're going to need to be able to collect those rents while you go through the process. And so this is really an important part of that because you can, it's laid out legally. You can give it to the tenants that are in there and you can legally demand that they pay you. And then they have to pay you instead of the person who's in default with you. And that could be significant. I often hear about people, oh, well, he collected, he collected rent for a year while he didn't pay me. And then I never got any of that money. Well, you didn't have the right thing in rents and profits in your deed of trust. All right. So now the second piece of it is the note. And I just kind of, you know, all these, these things that you're reading here, I literally just copied and pasted right out of my notes, deeds of trust, right? So um, these are the things that I think are important for the notes. And I use the example here because some of the things I wrote out, I literally just pulled it out of a loan that I'm doing. The loan is for 155000 So that might answer some questions that come out the road later, right? Mm -hmm. It's really, it needs to be really clear for you as the lender to write out in very clear terms what the note is, right? 13% per annum plus three points. And there's a minimum length of 128 day, 120 days. And then I define what a point is. A point is 1%, right? And that's what normally a point is. But I even, even though that's the term that everybody understands in the, in the legalese part, I spell it out crystal clear. And I think the per annum is something that everybody needs to pay attention to because there are a lot of lenders who will, I'm going to lend you at 13% for six months. There's a very big difference between lending for 13% for six months and, and lending for 13% per annum, right? And 13% per annum is 13% amortized over the whole year, right? And so per if it's not, if it's 13% for six months, it's really a 26% loan. And I do think sometimes lenders hide that information and it's not clear. And I would encourage you to be really clear because when that payoff comes, they're not expecting that payoff 
you have a one-time client and that client is never coming back to you. They're going to hate you, right? Because they didn't understand the note. And so I laid out like crystal clear, this is what a point is. This is the minimum number of days that I'm going to collect interest on. All right. Also, it's really important. Like, again, this is a note that's going out the door. So it's going to be due in about six months, right? Um, but the principal and interest is due and payable with sale of the property or refinancing of the property. Remember, we did hit that in the deed of trust where we say due on sale clause. But notice we hit it again in the note where we're crystal clear any refinancing of the sale of the property to do on that date. That's a very important date because that's the date of default, right? We talked about default a bunch of times. Sometimes you need to get to default. Otherwise, you can't get your property back. All right. So lay it out crystal clear. Give the exact date. All right. All right. So this is what I would, this is, this is where you take control of a situation. We talked about the reasons in the deed of trust that we put defaults in there. We put defaults in there so that we can control it. And that we control it a second way. Like we put people into default through things like the deed of trust. Right. And so once it's in default, what we do is we crush them with financial penalties, like crush them. 30% is my default rate. And trust me, it gets worse as I show you in a couple seconds, right? And I would like, I would think about in my career, and I don't know, maybe like 130, 140 loans yet, 0% of the time have I ever collected this number, right? This is just where if someone is making me mad, and like, they won't pay me my money. I give them the payoff of the 30%. And I'm like, give me my money. And then they're like, oh my God. And then I negotiate, right? And I just want my terms. But what I'm doing is I am making it terribly, terribly, terribly expensive. I do not have to collect the money. That's my choice. I do the same thing with my tenants as well. I start the pay or quit immediately. I start the eviction process, but then I get to decide but if I don't do this, I take the ability to make the decision away from me, right? And so 30% on the day of default and think about how like damning that could be. Let's say I got five loans with you and you didn't pay the insurance bill one time or you didn't pay the tax bill one time. You just went into default on all five of your properties, right? All five of your properties are now earning 30% interest. And just think about how powerful that is, right? That'll wake any borrower up and get them in line. If it doesn't, this one will, right? A payment went in default, a payment of 10% of the amount owed, including fees and interest. So they borrowed $150,000 and then they haven't paid for six months because I don't typically accept, or not accept, but I don't typically make people do monthly payments. Right now, like they owe me a total of in all the default, all the penalties, five days from default, they owe me a 10% penalty on that. Now that situation, it's like a 20% penalty. And then that, excuse me, a $20,000 penalty. And that $20,000 penalty is an added to the principal and that runs at 30%. Imagine that across five properties. So what you really do in that spot, and this is why it's so important, you do an absolute financial lockdown on the situation that benefits you. And then you get to decide what you're going to do. I wouldn't advocate making someone pay a 10% penalty. The only time you're ever going to really enforce this is at a foreclosure for which maybe you want the property. Think about that situation. Someone's got a good deal, right? And they and they've got $100,000 of an equity, but they ran into problems in their life and they stopped doing the work. They went into default. It would be nice to have that $100,000 in equity and have the home. So one thing that you can do is when you're in foreclosure is you add up every single penny that it is. And then at the courthouse steps, you offer the higher price, right? And so the person who borrowed it, eventually they could be on the hook for that money, right? But you're trying to inflate that price so that you can take it maybe at your own auction, right? That's when something where you might actually apply it. But this is a huge stick. Theodore Roosevelt, what was it? Walk quietly and carry a big stick. This is that. And I encourage you all to have something like this in your, in your note, right? My lender's insurance, right? Which is different than other title insurance. Like, so there's buyer's insurance, 
And now there's lender's title insurance. And so lender's title insurance is pretty cheap. You know, I bet right now, uh, we're talking to Matt and Charlotte, their lender is probably going to go see them. They have lender's insurance, right? They're going to go see right now, whether or not the lender or buyers. But if you're a lender, you have to have lender's insurance, which is different than buyer's insurance. And it's pretty inexpensive, maybe $150 or something like that. But I always make, I always, it's always necessary for them to have it. And it's always necessary for them to close it or excuse me, for them to pay for it. All right. They have to get the, they have to get property and liability insurance. All right. And they have to list me, RVA Property Solutions, which is sometimes the entity I lend out of. Um, um, they have to list me as an additionally insured on the property. And that is, hey, if there's a fire or something like that, by being listed as the additionally insured on the insurance, um, they can't cash a check. So if the insurance company sends them a $100,000 check, they can't cash it uh, unless we both have the signature on the check, which is very important so that someone doesn't burn down your house and run away with your money. All right. All right. This is the personal guarantee. Everybody I lend to it has to sign a personal guarantee. And so that is outside of their LLC. So when they're signing the note, their LLC is the borrower, right? Because we can't have a person because of usury laws in Virginia. So it's going to be an LLC almost always, right? And so when they sign the note, if they're educated, if they're smart, if they have good legal advice, what they'll do is they'll sign it. I would sign Rich Lennon, manager, managing member of whatever LLC. That's how I would sign the document, right? And so that in that instance, if something goes wrong, you can only sue the liability company for, for your money back. But if you have a personal guarantee, then the individual outside the LLC, you can go after their personal stuff. So they lose the protection of the limit of the liability. And it's an important thing to have. Right. And it's not merely a payment, it's a collection. And I'm not an attorney. Someone told me the difference between the two, but it does become significant. Like the payment is, hey, I'm going to pay you off of this house. And sometimes you can get a, get rid of the note. But the collection of the money basically means you can track an individual down forever that gave you a personal guarantee. All right. I get the driver's license number, social security number, and a home address at settlement as well. All that information goes with me. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. I cannot read the top of this. So I'm not sure what I'm. Oh, cross default. I think I mentioned this before. Um, the cross default is goes along with the cross collateralization of, hey, if you default on one note that you have with me, you default on all the notes. And we've already talked about the some of the real financial penalties of the default. All right. All right. Let's see. All right. All right. So another one that I like to put in there is I want to know if my borrower is in trouble. And one of the ways that borrowers will get out of trouble if they need money is they will take a note in second position. Hey, I've got my friend, you know, Jonathan, who will who will lend me $20,000, but he wants to secure it with real estate. So he wants to put a second note in deed of trust on the property. Um, you can't do that. If you do that, it's another way I put you in default. Now, if you came to me and you asked me, do I have the ability to allow you to put a note in deed of trust in second position? I do. And in a, in a given a search situations, I've allowed people to do it. All I'm looking for is to be notified so that I'm aware of what's going on with the property. Because if someone's borrowing money against the property, they're in a financial situation and that might affect whether or not you renew the note in six months. All right. All right. This is another one that's important. You have to say crystal clear because people will hide from you, right? When they, when you, they owe you money, they'll hide. And so you need to make sure in the note you say exactly how you notify them for the default and they have to put an address that you send it to. And if they change that address, they have to do so in writing. And so it doesn't matter if they moved or if they don't live at Aunt Sylvia's anymore or whatever. By having this in there, you can just serve the address that's in the note. And that constitutes uh, a declaration of default. Like if you have to send the foreclosure paper somewhere, you could send them to those spots, right?
All right, and this is another one that's important. You have to, I, I, it's capitalized because it's capitalized on my deed of trust. And that's why it looks a little bit awkward because I have it in really bold letters. We go back to that idea that we were talking about. I'm only going to lend to LLCs. I'm only going to lend to entities. I don't lend to individuals. I lend to entities. And this says you can't spend my money on anything else that's not my house. And if you do, it's fraud, right? And this, like when people building a pyramid scheme, what they often do is a rob Peter to pay Paul, right? And this is the clause in there that allows you to say you weren't allowed to do that. But if you're looking at anybody who's scaling and stuff like that in their business, I hear people saying, oh, I'm scaling all the time. What to me internally that means is you don't have any money because scaling is like super expensive. And so making sure you have stuff in here of like you can't spend my money on other things is really important. All right. I think this is my last slide. Um, and this I just produced a copy of my my personal guarantee, which I keep at the bottom of every note. Um, obviously, it's not John Doe. But this is a personal guarantee. It's pretty simple. Um, but the personal guarantee goes a long way and um, makes it so that people have a hard time hiding from you. So I highly recommend the uh, personal guarantee. And there it is. I, I really enjoy lending. Out of all the things I've done in real estate, lending has been the best. Um, you, you typically have to work real hard in the industry for a long period of time to be able to move a large chunk of your own money. Um, but I do think that that's the goal of most real estate investors. Um, I might have scared people off in my talk today, um, but I um, highly recommend it. I think it's very important for you to, if you're a borrower of money, you need to also be a lender of money and you have to understand both sides of the table. I think it's important to your overall development. All right. Rich, are any of these forms um, or having um, state state to state, each state may have similar forms and you're just filling in percentages, things like that, or not really? It, yeah, it, you need to, if you're lending in different states, you need to have a different, like to Anna's point earlier, it, not even all states have notes and deeds of trust. And so you really... Like right now, I'm doing a loan in Arizona. I, you know, don't ask me why, but I am. And so I'm really having that note and deed of trust written by an Arizona, a local Arizona attorney to do it. And so you really cannot take one note and deed of trust and move it from one place to another because I, I don't know if I was, if you actually have, if I actually had the deed of trust to show you, you would see it has reference to Virginia code in it maybe half a dozen times. Pursuant to code 849681, you have to do this. And you have to make sure that you're, to be enforceable, you have to make sure that you're complying with the correct rules. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, anyone? If no one has a question, I've got a couple, but we'll wait, I'll wait until the end. Hey, Susan, I, I got a couple of questions for Rich. Hey, Rich, good to see you. Glad, glad you're joining us here. I, um, I, I've been lending for a while now, and, and I appreciate the information you put out. On the personal guarantee, we always, first of all, we have every member of the LLC sign the personal guarantee if there's multiple members in that LLC. And we also require spouses of the members of the LLC to sign personal guarantees. Do you do the same? Uh, for your personal guarantees? I don't. I don't. I, I typically do it with who I perceive to be the owner of that organization. Um, sometimes there's a spouse where they each of them own 50%. But I typically, I would say I'm 95% of the time, um, if they're a complete stranger to me, I might want both people. If something's a little bit off, um, I'm lending out of state, for example, I might ask for both people. Um, but I'm, I don't, you know, I think for the LLC side, I think that the managing member who can just make sure they can sign the documents for the LLC. Um, I might think differently if it was a really, really big loan though. Like if it was like a million dollar loan, I might think differently. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then my second question was, um, I don't think you touched, I joined a little late, so I don't think you touched on it tonight, but are you also sending loan commitments? Like when you first talk to a borrower, borrower 
you know, explains the property, explains the deal to you, you agree to, to lend on it. Is, is your first action sort of sending a loan commitment to that borrower, outlining your interest rate, outlining your terms um, so they understand? Because I saw you sort of capture your terms, your rates, your points, all of that in your note and in your deed of trust. But I, I think we kind of, we send a loan commitment out so they are clear as to where our terms and our rates are going to be on that particular deal before we even get to the point of starting our documentation process. Are you doing the same? I don't. And I would say it's more of an indication of my internal process. So not all my entities are the same. And so if I'm doing all those loans, I'm doing one from IRA one, one from IRA two, one from LLC one, one from LLC two. And it becomes very complicated to figure out because the commitment's got to come from the entity that's going to lend. And I'll be honest with you, when you ask me, can you borrow money 30 days out? I say, yes, I have no idea which entity is going to fund that. And I wouldn't want to box myself in with something like that. Now, if it's a new borrower, they will often hit me up and say, hey, I want to, could you really lay this out for me? And well, I'll do that either in a phone conversation or it'll be through an email, but I don't have a standardized, hey, this is an official loan commitment. Normally we get involved. I just simply say, hey, go to the title company or go to the attorney, send an email, include all of us and introduce me as the lender. And then the, the attorney will ask me for a term sheet of some sort. Sometimes the attorney themselves have their own term sheet, right? And then we'll send something directly to the attorney. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate your time tonight. Thanks so much. Hey, no problem. Good luck this weekend, buddy. <laughs> Thank you much. So, Rich, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is you mentioned about them, uh, what if they don't pay their insurance bill and don't pay their tax bill? How, how are you tracking that they're actually paying these bills? Great question. So when you're listed as um, additionally insured or the, the mortgagee on that um on the mortgagee on the loan, if if it's canceled, they'll notify you. So you'll get a letter. And so let's say someone it buys a three-month term and then they don't renew, I'll get a notice a month out that says, hey, they haven't renewed yet. And then internally we'll process that. We'll reach out and we'll say, hey, before this date, we need we need to make sure that you have your insurance covered. And if they don't have their insurance covered by that date, We'll go ahead and pay it. Okay, so that's that covers the covers you for the insurance yeah. payment. What about tax payments? Taxes? Well, we know when all the taxes bills are, so we'll just go through at tax deadline, right? So, like, I just paid Chesterfield County. It was like June fifth or June sixth or something like that. So, uh, you know, someone internally, you know, one of my VAs will go in and scrub that list, and so it's okay. We got these you know, these 30 loans of the 30 loans, 10 are in Chesterfield County. Let's look them up. And the Chesterfield County website will tell you whether taxes have been paid or not. Okay. Okay. Good to know. My other question is, uh, I, I think you said in the beginning that you only lend to people who you know, uh, but regardless of that, okay, maybe not, but regardless when someone approaches you and they, they want to borrow money from you, how do they provide any type of documentation or anything that's traceable or provable that they're borrowing this money to rehab this particular property and in this, you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you know you're not just loaning, you, you've got a ton of security in all of your paperwork. Yes, you proved that tonight, but the property itself Okay, it's a great question. I know that it's a good, a good deal, basically. Well, the good deal part is it is that underwriting part, right? Where hey, we're gonna go with the ARV, and then you gotta like, is the construction reasonable, right? Someone who maybe is new to the construction might, hey, this is twenty thousand dollars, and you might look at it and be like, hey, that's like fifty. That's part of your underwriting because you don't want people to get in trouble. But I underwrite a deal; it's got to be seventy percent minus repairs. Like that's what I did as a buyer. And so that's what I lend at. It's just a number that I'm comfortable with. You have to bring 10% down. So now at the day of closing, 
I'm now in the deal at 60%, which is great, you know, because I flipped a lot of homes and I always seem to be in at 70%. But now as the buyer, excuse me, as a lender, now I'm in at 60%. And I do what I call reverse draws. And so if you are borrowing $50,000 from me on the construction side, I am absolutely not giving you that money at the table. Now, I will tell you from people when I was flipping homes that when I was borrowing money, right, I would only borrow from people who would let me take all the money at the table. As a lender, I won't lend to anybody who wants all the money at the table, right? And I've just flipped on the sides of the table. I understand the risk a lot better as the lender side than I did as the borrower, right? Because my borrower, I always intended to pay it back, right? I mean, they, in my opinion, they had no risk. As, the bar, as a lender now, I realize that's not true. And so I'm always in at that 60%. And then of the 50,000, I'm going to give it to you on draws of maybe 15,000 each would be ideal in a situation like that. So I'm going to get it at 60%. And now you're going to do another $15,000 of work. And so my loan to value then drops down to like 50%. And so that's how I stay secure in the deal. And so now you're going to send me pictures of that property or I'm going to walk it. If like we haven't done a lot of business together, I'll go walk the property. Like, oh, there's the HVAC, okay? Have you, as a permit, has it been permitted? Has, has it passed inspection? Can I turn it on? Let me see the roof. Okay, let me see the invoice for the roof. Okay, now I'm going to release it and give it to you, right? And so I do the construction draw that way. So in that scenario, the person who comes to me, they put like 10,000 into it at the time of purchase, and then they got to put 15,000 into the construction part. They're into the project for $25,000. And that goes a long way to securing my money. Right. It puts a lot of skin in the game from them. Right. And then it also puts me in a very, very low loan to value where I'm okay with taking the property back. And furthermore, it reduces your risk as you go. So as as they're doing more rehab, your risk is reduced as the lender. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Rich, how can people contact you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, my you know, I'll throw my, in the chat, I'll throw my email address and my phone number. I'm happy to do that. Um, assuming I can spell correctly, which is sometimes a problem for me. All right, here we go. Uh, well, that's direct message to Chuck. All right, I'm gonna have to figure out how to do the meeting chat because I also don't know how to use Zoom. No, you you want to you just give it to me or... Uh... Yeah. Oh, right there it is. Is that back in there? There we go. There we go. And there here's go. my telephone number. I can add you back into my address book. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Okay. So there's Rich's information. It's in the chat box. I have a question. Um, do you have are there any red flags where something happens to a borrower or something they say or something you know about them where you're like, that's a red flag. I, I don't want to borrow to them. And on the contrary, are there like golden stars where you're like, that would be a good borrower? Like, are there little things that come up in conversation or regard? Uh, I prefer someone who's had a failure, honestly. And so I prefer someone who I'm like, like what, what's the worst thing that happened to you? And they're like, well, I, I defaulted on this thing and this is what happened and this is how I got through it. And this is how I paid everybody back. And, you know, some of my best borrowers are the people that failed. And, you know, you, you're a little more cautious about that kind of stuff, but I, someone who's open and honest to me about their failures and like what they did, I, I view that as a very, as a positive. Um, contrary, if, if everything is rosy and they're walking on water all the time, I'm a little nervous. Um, I'm a little pe I'm a little nervous of people who tell me about all their amazing successes, you know, because I know the business is a, is a difficult one. And I know anybody who's been doing it for any length of time has had failures. And if you're not willing to be open about those things, uh, it, it would be a bit of a red flag for me. And are you doing like an interview or something with with new borrowers to get this information? Like, okay, not really. I'm I'm an asset I'm an asset based lender. You know, I think that was one of my slides of, you know, I, I'm okay with you being a criminal. Yes, I'd like to know ahead of time, but like I'm okay with you being a criminal because I'm going to make sure that my I'm secure 
not just with my documents, but um, with my loan to value. And I'm going to, if I do it right, I'm comfortable. For people who are just getting into lending, would you say there's a certain number of deals or a certain amount of time that you should try and work with experienced lenders, wrapping deals with them before going out on your own to like lend on a full deal by yourself? It depends on the individual. I think when you're confident enough, then you should go do it. Now, you know, I I use other people's money on wraps. You know, I, I do that a lot. And so a very common mistake that happens where people they'll they'll do a couple wraps with me, for example, and then they'll go out and do it on their own and they'll totally screw up all the paperwork. Like they got no clue what that stuff says. And, you know, right when they cut me out, they come back to me and ask me to fix it. And I normally fix it for them because we have a business relationship. But it always amazes me um, how people don't understand the paperwork before they try to do it. Like you got to like you got to know what it means when it's wrong, not when it's right. Because when it's right, no one cares. You know, when it's wrong, it matters. So, do you think transparency is good in that situation where if you were rapping with someone and they were planning to go out on their own, like letting you know and kind of asking? like for advice on the way, or are you saying more that like, just really know your stuff and don't pretend that you know it? Yeah, know your stuff and don't pretend. And you have no obligation to tell the person that you're allowing to wrap your money that you're going to go do it yourself. Because anybody who would try to restrict you from that isn't like a really good business person, right? And so you you have every right. And I would I would make the argument that you have obligations to go out and to learn to do it and to do it. And when you're when you're having your money wrapped, you're only earning eight to 10%. But when you're wrapping other people's money, you're earning 30 to 40%. And so by God, go get yourself some of that. Okay, thanks. Do you want to describe, do you want to define that or give an example of that if it won't take too long? Sure. Um, I have an example of a wrap. I'll do really easy numbers. So let's say that, and, and I, I lend this way a lot. Let's say the house is worth $300,000. Someone comes to me and through purchase and renovation or whatever, they want to borrow $200,000, right? So what I will do is, and I'm going to lend that money to them. It says 13% and three points, but for ease of business here, I'm going to lend to them at 20%, okay? Now I'm going to go find someone else's money, right? And what I typically do is I put 50% of my money in the deal. So in this scenario, $100,000 would be my money. And then $100,000 of it is going to be Uncle Bob's money, right? Uncle Bob is going to lend me that money at 10%, right? And so now I earn 20% on my $100,000. Plus I earn, since I'm charging the end borrower 20%, and I'm only giving Uncle Bob 10%, I also get Uncle Bob's extra 10%, right? That flows back to the underlying note. And so in that scenario, my $100,000 would be earning 30% return. And if I borrow from Uncle Bob at 8%, my return goes up. If I borrow, 12, borrow money from Uncle Bob at 12%, then my interest rate goes down. And that's called wrapping money is where most people... I often will refer to it as squeezing money. Um, it's also known as wrapping money. And, um, you know, my favorite way is to do a fractionalized note. But those are all just technical terms of the same thing. Rich, there's so much information packed into your presentation. It's just amazingly informative. And personally, I think that a lot of people would get... Um, would appreciate if you did like a one-day seminar on just lending. I appreciate that. Um, I am actually taking a little bit of that model. I've got, I'm doing a land trust seminar this uh, this weekend. Um, and I'll do a lending seminar as well, where I'll do something for four or five, six hours, something like that in videography. But I mean, I, I appreciate that. I was very thoughtful of you. Um, I'm just, everything I learned, someone else taught me. And people just gave me a lot. And, you know, in some ways I feel like I was just lucky and missed all the bullets. And, um, you know, I'm happy to pass that on. Lending is great. I encourage everybody to do it. 
and and I will I will back up what Rich has been saying is you got to have your paperwork in order because I did a deal that I won't go into ended up being made whole from it but spent months of lost sleep and angst over it because I didn't have any of the paperwork that I needed to have done and uh, found out after he defaulted that, yeah, he was kind of a criminal. <laughs> and that's a bad time to find out. You know, I'm sorry you had to go through that. But even yeah. then, you know, real estate, especially as long as that first, as long as you underwrite a little bit at the beginning, even when it all goes wrong, it generally works out. That's one of the beauties of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, unless anybody has any more questions, if you do, please jump in right away. Otherwise, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'll mention for the local folks, uh, Rich does have his uh, ring meetups in Midlothian. Uh, in, in my opinion, it's well worth the drive. There's a ton of value at those uh, meetups. Um, and I don't remember exactly when they are, Rich. I know they're like on Wednesdays or, or Thursdays. Um, yeah, I try not to walk into other people's groups and say something about my <laughs> groups. Like I, I do. It's called Richmond Ring, R-I-N-G. Uh, we, we meet for like 20 years. You could find us in on meetup.com or something like that. Yeah, we're around. Thank you, Dario, though. I, I'm going to bring all the Fredericksburg people with me anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do uh do you do transactional funding, Rich, or um like very, you know, we're gonna... yeah. And okay. I, I do transactional funding, yeah, for either a point or a point and a half, just depending on, you know, where and what it is. Okay, cool. For the people who don't know what that is, can you just quickly define that? Yeah, so uh, normally it's it's for like a double close often. And so if you're trying to do a double close on something, uh, technically in escrows, you know, even a double close, you can't use the end money. You have to have money in between for the first close. And so it is, I would wire money to an attorney. It normally takes like 48 hours and then like they buy it one day and they sell it the next day. And so it's very short term money, you know, like a day or two days or sometimes it's a week or something like that, but it's really, really quick money. Okay. What's your interest rate on that? It depends on the deal, but it's either a point or a point and a half. Okay. Which isn't bad for a day's work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not bad. Now it is, I think it's fair to ask the question, if I send $200,000, is it worth the risk only to get $2,000 back? Because, because there is risk, right? And then when it all goes well, it's great. But at the double, I've been in spots where the second close didn't happen. And so now the money is kind of stuck there and then you got to get it out and like, you know, unwind it, but it's not a bad day's work. If it all goes smoothly, I'll give you that. Mm. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that we've just about covered everything and a uh, last minute chance for anybody to hop in with questions and you've got Rich's contact information. Hopefully you won't be inundated with email questions in, in emails or phone calls, but um, I think people are pretty respectful of your time. And I want to thank you. It's been an amazing presentation, very, very valuable, ton of information. Uh, I don't usually get the chance to sit down and watch all of the recordings, but this one I'm definitely going to watch a couple of, at least two times, <laughs> just all to right. absorb. Okay. I appreciate it. I really appreciate that. So again, Rich Lennon, okay, and he's in uh, Richmond, easy to remember, Rich from Richmond. And next Thursday is the in-person meetup. It's just networking only, networking, socializing. It's at Wegmans upstairs from 6 to 8 p.m. And then the next, what did I say? I think uh, July 13th is the next virtual meeting here with the speaker. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's great to see everybody. Good to see new people. And everybody have a great night. <laughs>